Hello everyone and welcome to day four of the NHS Safeguarding Learning Together Week. My name is Cathy Sheehan and I'm Clinical Lead for Safeguarding. I'm hosting today's event. Today I'm joined by Lynn Romeo, Chief Social Worker for Adults, who will be sharing with us an insight into the, her role as Chief Social Worker and how health and care colleagues can work better together to safeguard adults. Before I hand over to Lynn, I would just like to cover a few housekeeping issues. Today's event comes to you via MS Teams Live and all cameras and microphone functions have been disabled. If you are having any technical problems, please try logging in using Google Chrome. Today's presentation will be recorded and along with the presentation slides will be available shortly after the event and it will be shared via our NHS, our Futures NHS platform. For those of you who are not on Futures NHS, you can sign up to our platform. You will need to complete an easy registration process. If you have an NHS.net, an NHS.net or a .gov.uk email address, you can self-register and the registration link will be available in the chat box. We have a feedback form and it would be really, really helpful for us if you could um, fill that in because it does help us to um, decide where we're going forward with our Learning Together Weeks. There may be times during this week that there's a difficult listen and if you need to take a break, break at all, please do so. Also, if you need support, please do contact myself or Kenny or any of the safeguarding team. We are here to listen. Next slide, please, Christiana. Finally, why not download our NHS safeguarding app? You can do this using your Apple phone uh, via Google Play, or you can hover your open camera over your, the QR code which is on the screen and it will download onto your Android phone. If you have any questions or amendments that you need that need to be noted on the NHS Safeguarding app, please email the safeguarding team at england.safeguarding at nhs.net. So without further ado, I would like to hand over and like to introduce and welcome Lynn Romeo, Chief Social Worker for Adults from the Department of Health and Social Care, who will be speaking on the role of safeguarding from a social worker perspective. Over to you, Lynn, and you're very welcome. Thank you. Hello. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me to come. Hopefully you can hear me. Is that uh, OK? Uh, so my name is Lynn Romeo and I'm the Chief Social Worker for Adults in the Department of Health and Social Care. And my role within the department is to be a professional advisor, so providing advice and guidance and support to ministers and officials on social work and social work matters. And uh, primar primarily that's around the policy and legislation to do with adult social care. So the Care Act, the Mental Capacity Act, the Mental Health Act, and underpinning that, the Human Rights Act, because um, social care and social work within it is very driven by a human rights, um, social justice principles underpinning it, and very much from the uh, using social work, the relationship work that social workers do to really listen deeply and carefully to hear of what people have got to say and what the issues are for them to work alongside them uh, to ensure that they're being supported and enabled to um, achieve the outcomes that matter to them. And that's very true also within the state safeguarding context. So they have statutory roles and responsibilities to undertake and part of my role is to make sure when uh, ministers and officials here are making policies and developing legislation that's in line with good practice and good principles. So next slide please. So just I'm sure I, I won't go into a lot of detail about this but this is what the Care Act says about who we consider uh, an adult at risk is and it's very clearly 
for the moment anyway, uh, people aged 18 and older and where they have care and support needs, they are experiencing or at risk of experiencing abuse and neglect. And, and, of, and of course, they're unable to really to protect themselves from that. Uh, so the care and support needs bit is really quite important uh, because sometimes I think people are referred where people are worried about them, but they're not necessarily people with care and support needs. And they're the things that need really to go to the police if there are issues about um, domestic abuse, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So very clearly within the guidance, uh, these are the principles of safeguarding that have been set out in the CARE Act guidance, uh, that empowerment, that we have to presume that people can lead decisions and have informed consent to say what it is they want to happen, that we take a preventative approach, obviously uh, things that what can be done to prevent things happening. And sometimes that includes a multidisciplinary approach. So in some councils, they'll work very closely with community safety, with estate officers to try and pick up on where there may be issues that could be prevented uh, and uh, avoid people getting into situations where they're going to be harmed. Proportionality is always a big issue. We learned a lot through what developed around child protection approaches. Um, ensuring that we're proportionate and that we're always remembering we're dealing with adults and we have to be uh, at least at the, take the least intrusive response as appropriate in proportion to the risks. And then, of course, the protection role of supporting and representing, particularly those in greatest need uh, who may not uh, be very well heard sometimes. But nobody can do this on their own. It's all about working together. And so I'm really delighted that this week is concentrating on how do we work across health, social care, with the fire brigade, with the police and with other key partners to make sure people and our communities are protected and supported. And then the accountability bit is very much about the local authority has the responsibility and accountability to inquire where there are concerns have been raised. Next slide, please. <clears throat> These are the range, I mean, that you can never really completely pin it down, but this is generally speaking the key areas that would, would be identified uh, as the types of abuse uh, to which we need to respond. Um, I mean, it was uh, good to hear you've already had a session around uh, FGM and forced marriage. Uh, we are also now trying to pick up on the um, modern slavery issues uh, and exploitation of people in that way and discriminatory or hate crime or that sort of abuse is also becoming more prominent. Um, and then, of course, through the Mental Capacity Act, uh, the neglect and acts of omission uh, area as well. Organisational abuse, of course, or abuse within organisational settings is a big issue. We've had uh, inquiries, as you'll be aware, Causton Park and so on, where sometimes the kind of uh, institutional setting uh, leads to uh, ways of behaving towards people that are in fact abuse, but people become blunted towards seeing it that way or responding appropriately. Next slide, please. So one of the key uh, practice approaches, I suppose you'd call it, was this making safeguarding personal, that it should always be very person-led and outcome-focused. And that was really to try and ensure, and this has happened, I think, too now with children, that people weren't being done unto. So making sure that the first step is to really engage the person in a conversation about their lives and how they want the support uh, to be provided with the safeguarding issue or concern that relates to them. Also really ensuring that that choice and control sits with that individual where where their wishes have to be overridden, they must be told why. So where there is a crime being committed or where they have uh, capacity issues that needs to be explained to them. And also it's really important about their their whole well-being need, needing to be considered in the context of a safeguarding concern or inquiry. And of course, that their feelings and wishes have to be paramount, uh, that they can't be uh, done unto or put on a kind of 
train track where they don't want to be there. We really do have to listen carefully and ensure we're working with them to help them to get to the point of safety or feeling uh, supported in the way that suits them. And sometimes that can be challenging because people are in relationships often with people who are caring for them. And some of those more nuanced approaches to safeguarding needs a lot of skillful work and conversation and ways to support people that can mean building trust over a period of time and creating opportunities for people to feel uh, there are options that they can pursue without undermining other key support that they want from people. Next slide, please. So in terms of how we work together and what you might be doing, obviously these are the key steps. Recognize yourselves, recognizing a concern, referring that concern, raising a concern or an alert, contributing to the risk assessment and triaging of information gathering. And then at that point, the local authority is responsible for triggering what, what is called the Section 42 inquiry, which comes under the statute uh, of the CARE Act. And then having done the work around that, ensuring that the local authority lead will review and report back uh, both user feedback and uh, to, your, to people who've referred and hopefully be able to uh, close that situation, having made the person safe. Next slide, please. So in terms of how the social workers who are in the main, the PP, key people within the local authority leading on section two safeguarding inquiries they have a duty to make those inquiries or to ask other people to make inquiries because sometimes it might be one of you uh, on the health side who's better positioned uh, because you have that relationship with the person or they're in a context where their health needs are primary to start to make inquiries in relation to what might be safeguarding concerns but it, remember, it does apply to a person with care and support needs, but it doesn't matter whether or not they're ordinarily resident in that local area, local authority area. If that is where they are, then the, uh, the local authority within which they are at that time has to make those inquiries with you. It doesn't matter whether they have care and support needs, but the local authority isn't meeting those needs. They still have to uh, make the inquiries. So it might be that no, no, they're not necessarily getting a care, care and support package from the local authority, but they still have care and support needs that may not be being met or somebody else is meeting them. And clearly, the key thing is that they're experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect. And as a result of their needs, they're not able to protect themselves. And that's often the case with people perhaps who have a learning disability or autism, where they're not, uh, they don't have the ability to protect themselves from people who may be exploiting or harming them. Next slide, please. So the ethos of this section in the Act and the underlying principles that drive uh, really good quality practice in this area is to be very outcome focused. What is it the person wants? What do they want the outcome to be? Being clear with them that that's what they want. Uh, ensuring that they're fully included as far as possible in decisions, that it's proportionate. Timeliness is absolutely key. Responding at the right time in order to make sure the right things happen, really, really key. Uh, very structured, everybody knows who's doing what and who's accountable, but also being flexible about that and being effective. Thank you. Next slide, please. So what might help when you're thinking about um, making a referral or raising a concern? It's always really helpful to give as much information as you have and you can give. Where appropriate, ensure that the families or the individuals are aware of the referral and that you're taking that action and that they will or may be contacted. If a regulated service is involved in the care and support, then at that point you also need to involve CQC. They regulate and ensure, as you know, because you will be regulated by them as well. Uh, and they have a responsibility in relation to care homes, home care providers and so on, if there's an issue uh, in relation to safeguarding concerns with a regulated um, uh, service. 
It's good to become familiar with recommendations of safeguarding adult reviews where safeguarding has wrong, gone wrong. So we've got a, a long history of them, sadly. Winterbourne View, it's almost over 10 years old now. I won't go through all of those. More recently, Causton Park, and there's a very good safeguarding adult review uh, report that I would recommend to you where it sets out very clearly key, um, key messages for all of those agencies concerned and practitioners concerned. So do have a look at that. And it gives you a good foundation knowledge into why it's important to raise the referral when you need to, and uh, that there's support available uh, for you in making appropriate referrals. Always contact your set, the local safeguarding team if you're not sure, and they, could, they should be able to talk you through uh, anything that you're not sure about. Also, check in, arrange for check in points with the safeguarding team because sometimes I think people make a referral and then they don't hear anything and they don't know whatever happened. So it's key to check. They, they should be doing this, but just, you know, check in with them and find out where are things up to, what else could, is it that you could do. And if the case doesn't lead to um, a full inquiry, then ask why and ask for them to be put in writing because you, you want to be reassured that what you've done is the right thing and that the right action was taken. But if you are unhappy with the response, then you should raise that with the team. And then, of course, if you're still feeling it's not being resolved, you can write to the local chair of the Safeguarding Adults Board in that particular area, and they will uh, take that up on your behalf. Next slide, please. So there are, a, a, just to think about uh, the range of uh, responses that the local authority or the social workers might undertake. It, get right, it ranges from the prevention and early intervention. There's a lot of work done by social workers in providing information and advice and engaging with different community groups to highlight and raise awareness of safeguarding. Often they'll be signposting to other services, uh, particularly, for example, domestic abuse services, fire safety or human trafficking uh, and so on. Multi agencies, uh, multi agencies approaches to risk and understanding risk. That's really key, and lots of local authorities will have what they call a multi, multi agency safeguarding hub where the police and others are involved in looking at the people that they're concerned about and making decisions together and getting sharing the information across that. We're all often very concerned about people who specifically are perceived as lacking capacity. So the whole Mental Capacity Act and the way in which uh, you approach your work with people uh, who have capacity and about decision specific uh, opportunities and best interest decisions, that's key uh, to really good safeguarding work uh, in this area as well. Poor care and quality issues is a huge um, area of referral, and this can often be about home care provision, care home provision, as you know, also sometimes private hospitals or NHS hospitals themselves. So that's something we need to work very closely with CQC, the regulator on as well. Uh, but it's also, I think, sometimes the fine line between clinical governance, care governance, and what needs to be done in terms of improving practice around the ways people, people are cared for and where that tips into uh, concern around safeguarding as it's set out under the Care Act. Misconduct by staff. Uh, there will be times when a particular staff member uh, does the wrong thing or is um, unnecessarily rough or abusive with somebody, and then that needs to be obviously taken forward as a safeguarding inquiry, and the police will be involved, and there are all sorts of issues around disciplinary procedures as well as any potential prosecution uh, and how uh, safety is assured within that context, and clearly working with people who have been subject to that and much more proactive support for the person as a victim of that as well. The, uh, that sort of touches on that as well, unsafe, abusive care and regulatory breaches, sometimes um, mis, um, wrong medication or over medication, those kinds of things, which again uh, tip into a lot of the work you'll be doing. The criminal justice process I've uh, mentioned and then the agreed multi-agency safeguarding procedures that will exist in particular safeguarding adult uh, areas, safeguarding adult board areas. OK, next slide, please. 
So I'll just say about about safeguarding adult boards because the statutory the Care Act put them on a statutory footing for the first time, even though they had been existing and carrying along before that. It was sort of a consolidation of best practice. So the safeguarding adult board within the local area, the local authority area, will authorise the policies, processes, the strategies and the guidance required to support what that board sees as its priorities and to ensure effective safeguarding across that local authority area with you as NHS partners. They're also required to publish a strategic plan that sets out how they'll meet their main objectives. And very importantly, they're to scrutinise, challenge and maintain an overview of adult safeguarding in that local authority area. And that's across what everybody's doing, both the local authority, uh, the NHS, uh, the community and so on. They're also responsible for ensuring that where something has gone wrong, that a safeguarding adult review, a SAR we call it, uh, is undertaken in accordance with the section in the CARE Act uh, to which that relates. And, they, and they, they see that. So safeguarding adult boards chairs are now starting to analyse a lot of the reviews and come out with a key learning. Uh, so that's something that uh, can be shared and looked at as well. They also have a responsibility to ensure that partner agencies are fulfilling their statutory obligations in, relate, in relation to safeguarding adults and to quality assure through joint audits of case files uh, and where things have gone wrong so that we can really learn lessons and try and improve what we're doing. And, and then there's an area around training, uh, the effectiveness and uh, ensuring that people get access to training, including multi-agency training, which would be jointly with uh, yourselves as NHS partners. Next slide, please. So sometimes there might not be an inquiry and sometimes people think, why aren't you know social care doing something about this? So that, a lot of that depends on the quality of the, ref the, of the referral and that triage time. And it may be deemed that if other processes are underway, this may not add value, but always ask for an explanation so you can challenge that if you need to. As I said, it may indicate poor care, but not necessarily a safeguarding concern. And uh, Sky, the Social Care Institute for Excellence, have a range of Q&As to support this. So uh, especially around this particular question. So do have a look at um, their, uh, their guidance on good practice and uh, frequently asked questions or issues that's worth having a look at as well and sometimes of course it, it can be that other services are seen as more appropriate uh, for example having actually undertaking a care and support review rather than a safeguard inquiry uh, but this should be fed back to you when you're making a referral so the actual reviews as I said, it happens when somebody with care and support needs has died or is seriously harmed. It's a multi-agency process which seeks to determine what each agency or individual involved could have done differently that would have prevented that harm or death from taking place. And there is a clear process and this is a statutory requirement. So um, uh, you and you have um, the opportunity to ask for one to be undertaken if it if it doesn't appear as though that's happened. And each local authority will have a policy and procedure in place. Uh, and you can certainly pursue that through uh, taking that up with the safeguarding adult board chair. Sometimes they may take place alongside a domestic homicide review or a children's serious case review. So sometimes these things have to be balanced together. OK, I think that is the end of my slides. Next slide. Yes, so that brings me over to questions. So I hope that sort of covered um, the key things you wanted me to cover, but um, I'm happy to take any questions or open it up for discussion. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Lynn, for such an excellent and informative um, presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions um, in the chat, which I think uh, would be really helpful if we could kind of um, extend the conversation into how we can best work together. So um, one of the questions is, what is your view 
of the often used term vulnerable adult in terms of adult safeguarding? Yes, yeah, so a good question. I think we have tried to start to change the kind of culture around using that term um, to talk about an adult who may be in circumstances which make them vulnerable rather than they, they are intrin intrinsically vulnerable. It's the circumstances which within which they are that often uh, makes them vulnerable to being exploited rather than that they themselves are vulnerable because I think vulnerable adult tends to kind of class this cohort of people as being like that, whereas in fact some people may have care and support needs equivalent to somebody else's, but because of the context and environment within which they're supported, they're not vulnerable to exploitation or abuse or a risk of harm. So it's a, it's a kind of nuanced thing, but I think it would be good for us to move away from saying vulnerable adult to saying adults who may be vulnerable because of the circumstances within which they are living or um, where there isn't appropriate support in place. But I'm happy to for, pe for people to come back and I'll um, kind of reply and uh, I, that's how I'm doing it, isn't it? I would reply in the, an email if necessary. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. That's really helpful. And, and we will be producing a Q&A as part of our legacy document after this, which will kind of go along with the recording and the slides. So that, that you know, that there will be an opportunity for that. So another question is, um, how might the NHS and healthcare system leaders demystify our wealth of hospital, community, primary care, domiciliary clinical services and healthcare access points to both social care colleagues and citizens? That's a good question. <laughs> I suppose it's very difficult, isn't it? We, it's, it's labyrinthine, isn't it? Our health and social care system. And I think we all, even those of us who know it sometimes, really struggle with knowing the right points at which to access the right care and how everybody works together. So I guess I'm hoping that through the integrated care boards and the care partnerships that we can start to uh, simplify or explain in ways in which my mother would be able to understand how everybody works together and the right points and that we do find ways of having appropriate integrated responses to people. I think sometimes int integration means different things to different people, doesn't it? And sometimes it can be seen very much as a structural thing. Who sits where? Do we all have the same heading above our um, lanyards? Or, or is it actually what is most important? How does that person, that citizen, that patient experience those services coming together to get it right for them and not um, duplicating or creating more kind of different pathways to go up. Very, very challenging, I think. So I think one of the mechanisms, hopefully, can be through the integrated care board uh, and the, that priority that, that that ICS gives to trying to um, build a kind of access and communication with their citizens that helps make that uh, simpler and as understandable as possible. But if anybody's got any good suggestions, send them to me on a postcard and I will um, put them into the system here and hopefully we can improve that. Thank you, Lynn. I really like that idea of this collaboration between us around actually if people have got good ideas, let's work together and kind of share that really good thinking um, to improve um, uh, safeguarding adults um, who are at risk. So building on that integrated care board kind of working, our next question is around how might integrated care boards integrate, that word again, integrate, making safeguarding personnel and meaningful into healthcare assessments for adults at risk or vulnerable? Yes, I suppose, um, I mean, the multidisciplinary training offer from the local area, um, which is overseen by the Safeguarding Adults Board, I think there's a real key role now to try and include a making safeguarding approach across all partners. So um, the key things are, the key questions are starting off with really 
engaging with and listening to the patient and understanding, as I said earlier, what matters to them and ensuring that they're fully uh, fully involved in discussions and decisions about how things might be taken forward if they are at risk uh, of neglect or abuse, or they have been in fact abused or neglected. Um, so I think there's something about the way in which communication, engagement and conversations happen with people, and then that, that how that can be supported through the next steps that I outlined earlier. I think that's, I think I'm getting at the right, is that the right I didn't quite get that question. Is that the right sort of area that we're talking about? How do health, how do people within health start to utilise that approach when they're working with somebody? Uh, interestingly, I was yesterday, I was involved in, I think some people were on that call actually, we had a safeguarding forum and somebody's doing a PhD to look at very specifically how some of the remote uh, assessments that are being undertaken, how you can build in triggers to that to make sure you're picking up on issues, particularly around domestic abuse or substance misuse, but how that might be extended to think more generally about abuse and neglect. So I think it's a challenge for us how we build in the right questions and ask them in the right way when we're working with people around their assessments, albeit they may be very healthcare focus assessments, but picking up on those things as well. I mean, I'm not a real, I'm not a complete expert on this, so I'm sure other people have got contributions they can make. And please, again, do send those those ideas in and I'll try and make sure we we stitch them into the policy work that's going on around safeguarding uh, within the Department of Health and Social Care. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, that's really, really helpful. Um, Another question is, uh, what happens if we think there should be a safeguarding adult review, but the local authority don't agree with with the decision, with the kind of referral friend that goes in? Yes, well, I think at that point, remember the safeguarding adult board chair is independent. They're independent of the local authority. So I think writing to or contacting the safeguarding adult board chair to say that you are not happy with the local authority's decision, and then they will have a responsibility uh, to look at that and um, address it uh, on your behalf. Thank you. Um, this is kind of back to, um, I suppose, actually how we can kind of um, work together better to kind of help citizens. So it's actually thinking about um, how we might provider safeguarding leads collaborate with safeguarding adult board chairs to understand that not all harm occurs in hospital, that hospital admissions might be um, might diagnose harm, which has been caused at home or elsewhere. Yes, OK, well, um, I think that does come up and I think Obviously, if somebody's being admitted to hospital and there are concerns that their their admission uh, is is highlighting that they've been abused or hurt in some way, then that is where it's absolutely appropriate to make a referral, uh, a con safeguarding concern referral, and that that should be picked up. I mean, there are always opportunities to ask your safeguarding adult board, if you can come uh, to a board and present issues that may be arising in your particular provider service around these issues, uh, to work with them to work out how those situations can best be addressed and you as a provider can best be supported to ensure the right thing has happened um, when you are raising a referral or a concern and that you're supported properly to support that person and that the right plans will be put in place for when they're ready to be discharged. The safeguarding adult board is a multi, you know, responsible for the multidisciplinary response. And if you as a provider are concerned about those issues, then please do get in touch with your chair uh, and board and ask either to come to a meeting and present those situations or ask what can be done from that, from the perspective of the board to try and pick up on some of the gaps or concerns around appropriate responses.
it's also just sometimes worth talking it over with the safeguarding lead within the local authority because that is something that should be responded to yeah thank you lynn that's really helpful um and i think you know it feels like i'm bombarding you with uh, there's loads <laughs> and loads of questions and but i think uh, I'm, I'm going to finish on my last question now if that's all right to give you a little break but um, what role um, does training both pre and post qualification play in developing a collaborative mindset in relation to safeguarding adults? Yes, that's a very good question, actually. I mean, uh, we I think we could do better at joining up pre qualification training across the various professions. So I know social workers, they go on their social work, social work students go on their course and they do their training and nurses go on their courses and they do their training and we don't I think in the universities take enough opportunity to bring people together around particular common concerns or themes that it would be really good for people to have that joint opportunity to train together and develop that shared vision and commitment and mindset about dealing with this so I think in some universities I when I do go into them I do try and push that medical students, nurses, OTs, physios, social workers should come together for some thematic work and also around communication skills and engagements and how you handle those very nuanced, uh, complex conversations. I think that's a real opportunity to bring people together. But post qualification, again, I think there there are all there will be safeguarding adult training courses, workshops planned and ongoing. Uh, all of the time and it's the safeguarding adult board's responsibility to try and ensure that they're as multidisciplinary as they can be so that people are working and learning together and understanding the roles and perspectives that uh, the different professionals are taking and the issues that may be impacting on each professional so that there's a there's an understanding of, of how people can negotiate and work together to get it right for the person the family the carer and so on so I think we could you know it's always a big challenge but I think there's a lot more we can do in this space and again I hope that the integrated care boards can help really drive this forward not just in relation to safeguarding adults but also children uh, but also often I think a group of people with mental ill health often don't get um, the level of attention in terms of their care and support needs and safeguarding concerns that they should and we've recently done quite a bit of work on people experiencing homelessness and that we're often missing identifying a that their care and support needs and responding to those but uh, also not attending to uh, serious safeguarding issues that they may be facing uh, that we often may just glide over because we see it as, as sort of that's their lifestyle choice when in fact they often are in circumstances which make them very vulnerable to um, neglect or harm or in fact death uh, so we've got really some key challenges in that area too so I think tr training that would bring together um, community psychiatric nurses CPNs mental health is I can never remember the right term for them but uh, they're changing it all the time but general nurses, um, learning disability nurses, social workers, uh, occupational therapists, the everybody who is working together at some point to try and support people. I think a shared kind of value base, a way of working with people, the making safe and safeguarding personal approach, that will all help contribute to a better offer for the people we're here to serve. That is fantastic, um, Lynn, and thank you so much for um, taking time out of your busy day today to come and speak at our um, event uh, and our Learning Together Week. It's really, really appreciate it. And actually, I think we'll probably have more of these where we can actually work collaboratively together to actually work together, listen to each other, you know that there's the there's absolutely loads of questions um, that's come through that we'll we'll share with you so that you can um, add your um, your view on them, um, which will um, 
or share with our, our kind of um, attendees, which will be fantastic. Um, but it's, it's really appreciated you coming today and uh, working co in collaboration with us. Um, oh. As I mentioned earlier at, at the beginning of the session, there's a feedback form. Please do um, fill it in for us um, because the suggestions will inform our Learning Together weeks going forward. Um, so these sessions that we've we, we've been having, they've been created after listening to you and um, and listening to what you need um, to learn. So what can you do after this session? We all need to actively listen. We need to believe what we hear and we all need to do something to improve trauma informed services for victims and survivors whilst preventing perpetrators and disrupting offenders. The National NHS Safeguarding Team will prioritise listening to you when you need a listening ear. Ongoing learning will support you to be more professionally curious, help you avoid re-traumatising the people you support or care for, support you to find moments for self-disclosure and indeed to join a social movement. Let's learn together and support each other in our new normal. We'll be hosting our last webinar tomorrow with our host, Kenny Gibson, Deputy Director of Safeguarding from our national team. And we will be welcoming the two of the regional clinical leads for Liberty Protection Safeguards, Shelley Farnan and Nikki Sedgwick, who will give an update on the Mental Capacity Act and indeed Liberty Protection Safeguards. Although, as Lynn said earlier on, we're working in the legal context of the deprivation of Liberty Safeguards. It is critical that each of us looks after ourselves to safeguard each other, the patients and citizens under our care. I'd like to thank you again for joining our webinar today. Have a great afternoon and I'm going to give you back uh, 19 minutes to um, maybe have a lunch break and a nice cup of tea. So have a great afternoon and thank you very much for coming. Take care. Bye bye.